The Remedial Herstory Project is a nonprofit working to get women's history into the primary and secondary history curriculum. To help us meet our goal, we produce media, lesson plans, and so much more. You can check it out on our website, www.remedialherstory.com. Our project is funded through grants and by patrons, potentially like you. Thank you to our patrons, Jeff, Barbara, Brooke, Christian, Kent, Jenna, Nancy, Megan, Leah, Mark, Nicole, Alicia, Katia, Michelle, Jessica, Laura, Jackie, Annabelle, Dawn, and Megan. If you would like to join these wonderful people and become a patron, you can head over to patreon.com and become a supporter of the Remedial Herstory Project. You too can help us reform education and allow women to be seen, heard, and complicated. Hey, Kelsey. Hey, Brooke. Want to tell them what's happening in today's episode? In this episode, we are traveling to Louisiana. Louisiana. And we are going to be talking about free women of color and the types of businesses they ran there. Yes, please. Let's go. Okay. Hello, and welcome to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%, the podcast that explores what happened to the women in history class. Now, here's your host, Kelsey Brooke Eckert, and her partner in crime, Brooke Neva Sullivan. In this episode, we're going to be asking the question, how did free women of color carve out space as entrepreneurs in Louisiana? And we are joined on the episode by Dr. Evelyn Wilson, and I am so excited to share this history with our audience. I know. This is definitely, well, I feel bad being a New Englander sometimes because I don't get as in-depth of an education on other states as I probably should. But Louisiana is definitely one I'm always fascinated to learn more about. Yeah. And so... What century are we talking about with... with? So she's looking at women of color in the antebellum period, so before the war. Okay. Slavery exists, um, but these are free women. And that is, like, I think a very under-researched area because... Your brain is, assumes that women of color were not free at this time period. Yeah. So we're talking, you know, these are free women of color, and we are... You know, a lot of times there's this assumption that they are some sort of sex worker or, you know, washerwoman or, you know, like other kind of like demeaning, you know, housekeeper and things like that. And the, her research um, in it, looking into this region that she covered, she looked at all these women of color and all these different businesses that they operated that that really is is kind of a myth for right. for where she was researching and um and it might have been true in other places but she found sort of that the opposite um that these that women had really interesting and unique businesses that they were operating um and so i'm so excited to have her on the podcast yeah. and to have her introduce herself to our audience i know i'm here for this yes let's go well hello i'm evelyn wilson i um been a lawyer for 30, almost 40 years, um, and taught law school for 28 years. Um, After teaching, I retired and went to graduate school to get a PhD in history. Um, While teaching, I learned about three people of color in West Louisiana Parish and chose that as my dissertation topic. So I've been studying people of color who lived in West Feliciana Parish in Louisiana before the Civil War and found four female entrepreneurs whose stories I'd like to share. How did you go from law to entrepreneurship? That seems so interesting. How did you stumble upon these women? I found that the uh, person who instigated the lawsuit, which caused my law school to come into existence, had grandparents who grew up in West Louisiana Parish. I wrote a biography of um, this man, Charles Hatfield, and while doing his biography, I came across these women in the parish who were entrepreneurs there before the Civil War. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. So um, tell me about the research that you did for your dissertation. This is amazing. I walked through the conveyance records and identified every person of color who lived in the parish uh, and 
transacted some kind of business that required it to be reported inside of it. Louisiana is a mixed jurisdiction state. It adopted the United States Constitution, of course, and its criminal law and procedure, but it also has civil law that um, from the Roman law. So it shares the civilian heritage with countries like France and Spain and Italy and um, all around the world. This civilian heritage uh, requires notarizing documents, that is, keeping very comprehensive records of activities. And so one of the activities is purchasing land. So you can sell and purchase of land using the advancement. Um, because uh, slaves were treated as valueless land, all the records of um, enslaved persons who had gotten sold from the parish were also reported in the bank's records. When an enslaved person is free, that record is made uh, in the Gavarian's records. In 1830, Louisiana passed a statute that required its free people of color to uh, record their presence in the parish where they lived. And so those records were also in the Gavarian's records. So I could walk through those records and identify free people of color, learn what they were doing, uh, what purchases they made, what kinds of businesses they had. I was also able to look at some plantation diaries and records uh, preserved in the libraries in Louisiana and, and learn more about the people of color and how they interacted with the baby. I can see how you've incorporated your legal background into this because it is it seems like statutes are really driving your research and, and your ability to follow these these women, find these women. Yes, that's very true. I did look through <laughs> all of the legislation on people of color um, from 1812 all the way up to wow, that's amazing. So you, you stumbled upon all the women of color in that time period. I believe that's so. decades yes. of time. That's so impressive. <laughs> uh, a very small community of 14, 15,000 people and a smaller group of free people of color. So we're looking over the periods of time at 100 people at any given time, although it might be 150, 200 people altogether. But yes, I did look through all of those records. And it was very interesting research. It's very interesting to see how people of color got along so well with uh, white people in a society that was so dependent on slavery. So tell me about these four women that you chose to highlight in your dissertation. So three of these women, Nellie Wooten, Maria Wicker, and Henrietta Coleman, owned restaurants and or boarding houses, while the fourth, Keisha Middleton, worked in a grocery and later was a partner in a brick-making business. So just for some background, the state of Louisiana is shaped like a boot. And West Feliciana Parish sits in the instep of that boot. It's bordered on the west and south sides by the Mississippi River and bordered on its north side by the state of Mississippi. And parishes in Louisiana are political subdivisions that are comparable to counties in other states. 1830, West Feliciana Parish had two towns. By Usera had a natural port and was a bustling river town with retail stores, taverns, boarding houses, warehouses, horse stables. Its streets were filled with riverboat crews, stevedores, travelers, merchants, cotton factors, shoppers, and farmers. The parish's cotton, indigo, and sugarcane were loaded from its docks. By 1850, Bayou Sarah was the largest port on the river between Natchez and New Orleans, and was the commercial hub for a large rural area. Bayou uh, Sarah is now gone, washed away by repeated flooding. The second town in the parish, St. Francisville, was located on a bluff overlooking the river. It housed the governmental offices, the courthouse, the prison, the post office, and retail businesses. Stately homes from that era can still be seen on its streets. As a frontier agricultural region in a state that committed slavery, 
West Feliciana Parish had a full complement of enslaved people. Enslaved workers using whatever rudimentary tools were available to them did most of the labor intensive work required to transfer this virgin land into a wealthy agricultural community. They cut the trees and prepared the lands for crops. They planted, cultivated, and harvested the indigo, cotton, and sugar cane sent from the parish and built the roads, bridges, and other constructions needed in the parish. In 1830, West Louisiana Parish's enslaved population was almost three times the size of its free population. By 1840, the count of enslaved people had reached 10,910. Despite the presence of this large enslaved population, about 100 free people of color lived in the parish. Just a note on the term free people of color. The 1830 census used the term free colored persons. However, the Spanish and French, who occupied Louisiana before it was owned by the United States, used the terms personas de color or gens de color, which translate into free people of color. Louisiana adopted that term, free people of color. For Melly Wooten, ran a popular tavern and inn at the mouth of the Bayou Sour Creek. She did not begin her life as a free woman of color. She was born in 1787 in Virginia and transported to what is now West Louisiana Parish, but was then a Spanish territory. In August 1809, John Rouse, a white merchant from Genoa, Italy, purchased 22-year-old Wooten and her eight-month-old son, William, at the behest of his cousin and business partner, Antonio Velasco, also from Italy. Rouse, in partnership with Velasco, operated a dry goods stores in Bayou Sara that sold a broad range of everyday items, including flannel, linen, calico, cheese, fish, gin, and canvas. Wooten's older daughter, Carolyn, was not so good for how Wooten and Alaska came to know each other and where they consummated the relationship is sheer speculation. In 1809, however, Wooten and her son moved into the house of Bayou Sarah, where Antonio Velasco lived. In October 1816, Antonio and Alaska purchased the lot next to where he, Nelly, and their children lived. Three months later, he died. In his will, Alaska declared that he had two children born to Nelly. Explained that he owned Wooten's children, eight year old William, valued at $350, and five year old Marguerite, valued at $275, and directed that his children be free. He described Wooten as heretofore my slave, now free, now pregnant, and left to her cows and hogs and the lot he had recently purchased. Wooten operated a tavern on her lot and developed it into a popular restaurant and boarding house. Wooten's cabin was very highly regarded and served both river traffic and plantation gently. In 1830, Anne Royal, the white widow of an army officer, visited Bayou Sarah from Washington, D.C. She described Bayou Sarah as a low swamp with a few houses, two or three warehouses and schools, and two taverns. She noted that one of the taverns was kept by white men and that the other, kept by Wooten, was better. The table at Wooten's tavern was set for dinner when she arrived. She found her bed chamber quite neat and comfortable, with bars to keep out the mosquitoes. In 1838, the diarist and plantation owner, Bennett Barrow, took his wife, mother in law, and children to Bayou Sarah and dined at Old Mary's. Despite having been enslaved herself, Wooten readily purchased enslaved people. Surrounded by slavery, Wooten may have given little thought to her own personal history or to the plight of her daughter left behind with her prior owner. Slavery was the basic in West Louisiana Parish and deeply embedded in its economy. Wooten did what other people around her were doing. She employed the uncompensated labor of others for her own advantage. In 1834, Wooten purchased a lot near her hotel and installed a horse stable there. She may have transported her guests from the railroad 
or from the docks to a hotel, or may have carried people and baggage up the steep hill to the town of San Francisco. Would you continue to buy people and continue to buy lots and buy you Sarah? In 1840, Wooden purchased her granddaughter, Margaret, and Margaret's son, Augustine, the daughter and grandchild of her daughter, Carolyn, who had been left behind when Wooden was purchased. Carolyn was now dead. Wooden took Margaret and Augustine to Cincinnati, where they could be free. In 1842, Nellie Wooden bought 220 acres on the water of Bayou Sarah for $3,500 from John C. Morris. To pay for the land, Wooden gave Morris a $2,000 promissory note originally issued by one white man and payable to another. The note had been endorsed to Wooden. Wooden now endorsed the note to Morris. The promissory note passed from one hand to another as if it were cash. In addition, Wooden gave her own promissory note for the remainder of the purchase price. In these transactions, Wooden was participating in the credit economy of the parish, giving and receiving promissory notes, along with cash, to make purchases. Wooten grew cotton and corn on her 220 acres. In January 1848, she hired Daniel Ricker, a white man, as her overseer. Ricker worked until October, and when he asked for his wages, Wooten refused to pay. Ricker sued Wooten for his wages. He claimed he had raised a good crop. The cotton had been gin bailed and shipped off, and the corn was rapidly being consumed by her farm animals. He even paid him his wages, and the suit was dismissed. 24 years earlier, Jean Gombo had sued Nellie Root for wages. In that suit, Wooten denied she had a contract with them. She claimed that his services would not work more than the cost of his board and lodging while he lived in her boarding house. She stated, she took him in, destitute and fed him, naked and clothed him. The court ruled for Wooden. Gamble received no pay. By June 1853, Wooden was willing to give up her hotel business. She would die later that year. Her son was living in New Orleans and her daughter showed no interest in running the hotel. Wooden sold Nellie's hotel to William Glass a white man born in Kentucky. Glass paid $500 back, promised to pay four installments of $750 each. Glass was an experienced restaurant too, but proved unable to pay his notes. Ruby's son and daughter, Antonio and Bertrand Alaska, reacquired the property in July 1854. Shortly before Wooten died, she sued John Morris's heirs to collect on a promissory note Morris had signed in her favor. She did not live to learn that the Supreme Court in Louisiana ruled against her. The court determined that the note was a gift and did not evidence a debt. In its ruling, the court announced the evidence tends quite strongly to the conclusion that the relation of concubinage did once exist between Wooten and Morris. Concubinage was a marriage-like relationship between two unmarried people, and restrictions applied as to what gifts parties in that relationship could give to one another. Traveler Anne Royal reached a similar conclusion about Wooten and Morris. She wrote that Morris was smitten with her charms and her property, made love to her, and it was returned, and they lived together as man and wife. Royal commented that Wooten was the ugliest man I ever saw, and if possible, he was ugly. So they were well matched. She added, this madam and her Irish gallant have an expression of horror about them. After Wooten died, the inventory of her real estate listed eating place for a 220 acre residence just south of Paisa Creek, valued at $3,000, and eight lots in Bayou Sara, valued at $8,000. Her personal property, valued at $3,790, included mules, horses, oxen, cattle, promissory notes, a wagon, and cotton and corn. The 15 people she held in slavery 
were valued at 12,600 bodies, making the total wealth at her death $24,390. Wooten had transitioned from an enslaved woman to a well-to-do woman, a landowner, by the time of her death and left her children a financial inheritance. The Remedial Herstory Project is hosting its second annual Summer Educators Retreat to help teachers integrate more women's history and literature into their curriculum. Studies show that educators currently teach women's history between 5 and 20% of the time, with 5% being the plurality. Our retreat will feature speakers from around the world and be available online and in person and provide educators with dozens of packaged lesson plans, videos, and other tools and resources to get women into every unit of their curriculum. The best part is that in-person attendees will get to network and relax with peers who are passionate about working to incorporate the diverse history of half the population all but left out of the history classroom. The retreat will take place at New Hampshire's Common Man Inn and Spa at the heart of the White Mountains of New Hampshire, the best place to be in August. The retreat will take place between August 8th and 10th. Interested people can learn more on our website at www.remedialherstory.com slash summer-educators-retreat. Could I ask a question about that? um, Howard Zinn's book, A People's History of the United States, talks about the drawing of the color line and sort of race-based slavery. And there are lots of examples like 12 Years a Slave where, um, you know, simply because he was a free Black man in the North, he was captured and brought back into slavery. And these women just seem so fascinating to me because here they are, women of color, who are powerhouses in their communities, you know, the fact that they could say no to a, to paying a a white worker on their property um, and own slaves themselves um, is just, it's, it seems contrary to the idea that I don't know that that color line was as, as thick as it, as it, as other people are saying it is. What do you feel like, is there evidence? And I know a lot of the record you're working with is is legal record, um, but is there evidence that they received pushback based on race or gender or anything like that in in their entrepreneurship? Because they just seem incredible, and I'm I'm shocked. <laughs> um, so I think this line of race um, to different forms in different places. So clearly, when Virginia made the decision that its um, original uh, people who were brought into Virginia from Africa were given the seven years of indentureship and then got freed after seven years. Um, When Virginia made the decision that uh, they had not entered into a contract, therefore they could be considered captives and enslaved for life, that that decision was based on skin color. That is, we're going to keep the black ones, we're going to let the white ones go free after seven years. So that that skin color was important very early. I don't know what this is. Um, I don't know what set up Williams Clearly, the um, idea of, of differences even goes back to Williams' war up in Massachusetts when, when the Indians were portrayed as horrible, ugly, mean uh, people just to to excite the white people in opposition to the Indian. So, so this, there is difference. Okay, I, I don't want to say there's no difference. But what I found in West Louisiana Parish, and again because it's a, a frontier area, um, was that once you step out of being enslaved, you became a member of the community. Now, there were uh, people, there's one incident where a um, free person of color was invited to eat at, you know, this person, uh, Barrow was the diarist. So a free person of color was traveling with a white man. Both of them had come to Barrow's house. When Barrow invited the white man to eat, the white man invited the free person of color to eat. And Barrow reports in his diary about how angry he was that this happened, but the fact is he allowed him to eat. You know, the fact is the, the white belt had been hanging with a few person of color. They were um, out together and Barrow allowed him to eat. And he said, you know, I'm not going to do it the next time. 
to get back to the institute to get back to And Barry was the owner of more than 100 slaves, so he clearly had that idea of color line in front of him. Mm. So what I found is that the color line moved. It was important sometimes, it was that for another. When it came to these interracial marriages, um, you know, she had to sort of bat- battle the idea that she was a concubine, right? Um, she's trying to prove that this was a loving relationship. And um, and I'm curious, I mean, I know that a lot of states had banned interracial marriages. So was it impossible for them to be married um, in Louisiana? In Louisiana, it was completely Yeah, out. okay. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. And um, the Cuban rule that prohibited gifts from married uh, from people living in Cuban without the benefit of marriage, uh, it prohibited gifts because very often, again, going back to that story of the kept free woman of color, uh, often their the paramour was already married, and there was concern that he was giving money that might go to his legal wife to a woman who was not his legal wife. Yeah, so she's um, married people can make gifts to one another, but people who live in Cuban age cannot. Um, they can make 10% of the removal their property, but they cannot be this removal their property. Um, and this court said the project of Cuban age relationship we can't be ready for Maria. I would love to learn about her. <laughs> Our second entrepreneur, Maria Wicker, ran a restaurant business on the Bayou Serra lot she purchased in 1845. In 1842, at age 30, Maria Wicker purchased her freedom and the freedom of three of her children, Lewis, William, and John, from Daniel Wicker, the children's wife father. The act recited a consideration of the sum of $1,200. In 1850, the our census taker reported that Maria, Bettis, William, and John were still living in Daniel Wicker's household, along with two younger children, Rachel Martha and Benjamin Wicker, who had been born free. The substantial consideration recited as, a, as payment for the emancipation of Maria and her three children ensured that their freedom would not be considered a gift from a family to a concubine. Daniel Wicker died of yellow fever in 1853. Maria Wicker had watched as two of her sons were sold away from her. Now that she was free, she hired someone to serve for them. By 1855, Wicker had saved the $1,669 she needed to purchase three sons, Albert, 24, and Edward, 20, who were then in New Orleans. She was now reunited with her sons as their enslaver. Wicker did not emancipate these sons because an 1855 state law required newly emancipated people to leave the state. Instead, Wicker gave them full permission to hire themselves out as servants or otherwise in hotels, on board steamboats, or other places where their vocation may fall them, and to keep any money they received from their work. This was as close to free as she could get them and still keep them. In Louisiana. In 1856, Wicker bought the lot adjoining her restaurant and expanded her business. Four of her children lived as waiters. Wicker's business survived the Civil War, and in letters sent to Rhode Island, both George and William Green proclaimed their pleasure at eating there. In 1866, George wrote, ate an excellent dinner at Maria Wicker's Hotel. Maria is an old darkie and she keeps a first rate house. In 1867, William wrote, I proceeded to the modest hotel of Aunt Maria Wickers, which is a model of neatness and good living. At her death in December 1867, Wicker owned her two lots and personal property valued at $633.25. She had a cooking stove. Six cane bottom chairs, three tables, a side board, a looking glass, straw pockets, an eight day clock, a book stand with books, and a pony, buggy, and harness. She left four adult sons and two minor sons. 
Our final restaurateur, Henrietta Coleman, had been born in Kentucky. In 1856, Coleman purchased the lot on the other side of Wigger's restaurant and operated a boarding house she called Henrietta House. Coleman's Hen Henrietta House had seven guest rooms and two servant rooms. Each guest room had a bedstead, two mattresses, and a ewer and basin. Her gents' double room contained a table, a sideboard, a lounge, a washstand, and a noir, a looking glass, two bedsteads, four mattresses, and a dinner bed. Other bedrooms had a looking glass, a washstand, a settee, a seated foot bath, an iron wash kettle, a brush tray, an armoire or a bureau. One had a piano forte. Coleman's parlor room had nine parlor chairs, a sofa, three rocking chairs, a whatnot cabinet, a looking glass, and a Brussels carpet and rug on the floor. Henrietta House featured a dining room with an extension table and a variety of serving dishes, including soup tureens, goblets, cut glass fruit span, cake span, preserved dish, and cream kitchen. The kitchen had two tables, a cooking stove, and a preserved kettle. Storeroom had a refrigerator. In addition, Coleman had seven head of cattle. Despite the size and luxuriousness of her boarding house, Coleman was listed in the 1860 census as a washerwoman, with real estate valued at $1,000 and personal property valued at $500. The boarding house, with its exquisite accoutrements, was clearly undervalued. And this is a time when your question about the color line might come in. Here we have a census taker who ignores the reality. Yeah, absolutely. That's so fast. So she's listed as a washerwoman? Wow. That's a demotion. <laughs> and uh, I've said of our entrepreneurs, uh, I mean, uh, none, were, well, none were listed as entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So there's Washington or uh, Dairy Keeper or some other thing other than mm -hmm. owner of an establishment. So yeah. Wow. In June 1876, Federal officers arrived in West Virginia <laughs> to investigate the recent lynching of 30 or so black men in the parish. These officers held interviews with parish residents at Henrietta Coleman's Henrietta House. Henrietta House was both spacious enough and of high enough quality to accommodate the needs of these federal authorities. Henrietta Coleman died in 1877. Um, so I have to think that it was the best place available if that's the place that the federal officers chose. And so our last entrepreneur is Tisha Middleton. She participated in two different businesses, neither of which was a restaurant. Antonio Picaluga purchased Middleton in 1825. Picaluga operated a flat boat that served as a grocery store for the local community of her travelers on vessels using the Mississippi River. The boat housed the shop from which goods and liquor were sold and had a big room and two back rooms for lodging. Nicoluga emancipated Middleton in 1827. Although she was now free, Middleton stayed and the was helpful. But she did not bear children for that. When Nicoluga died in 1833, he left all this property to Middleton, noting that she had rendered him important services and had conducted herself as to entitle her to his gratitude and friendship. Middleton employed a white man, Samuel Stevenson, as her clerk to manage the flat rate of business firm and agreed that he would receive half the profits from the sales. When she asked him to provide an accounting to her, he refused. When she asked him to leave, he again refused. Middleton filed suit, and a court ordered him to leave. Soon thereafter, Middleton sold the flat boat and its contents. In 1836, Middleton and Jonathan Ellsworth, a white acquaintance of Pithaluga, together purchased a long eight and improved acres of land. Middleton signed her name to the act. Ellsworth was a brickmaker, and Middleton became his partner in the brickmaking business. They lived together on their land. 
1838, Middleton became very ill and she died in April 1840 after a long and lingering illness, diagnosed as Ruxy. The inventory of Middleton's estate included three promissory notes valued at $2,400, household goods, and personal items, including a Negro woman named Charlotte, about 40 years old, and a bundle containing Middleton's free papers. Middleton had carefully preserved this evidence of her freedom, even as she kept another woman enslaved. Ellsworth claimed that he owned some of the property in the toilet that belonged to Middleton, and the judge allowed Ellsworth to keep the property he claimed, recognizing that Middleton and Ellsworth had been living together and had intermingled their personal property. That a white man lived openly with three women of color without an issue of concern and resolution on the parish. Ellsworth gave an account of the business partnership he had had with Middleton and asked for reimbursement for the money to spend on her behalf during the two years she was ill. Samuel Vanderhoof, the white associate of Ellsworth, testified in support of Ellsworth's claims. He knew Ellsworth and Middleton had been business partners and agreed that Ellsworth's business accounting was correct. Thomas Turner, another white man, testified that Ellsworth had lost a great deal of time from his work attending to Middleton during her illness. The testimony of these two men spoke to the entanglement of the lives of Ellsworth and Middleton. Middleton was a companion of Ellsworth and a contributor to their joint success. Her story is atypical in that she shared up her life with two different white men and had no children for either of them. Children had often been a catalyst for them to inhabit with and emancipate the mothers of their children. Also atypical was the type of business she pursued. Most of the free women of color in the parish were seamstresses, restauranteurs, house cleaners, or washerwomen. Middleton had been a merchant and a brickmaker. These four ladies, Nellie Wooten, Maria Whitney, Henrietta Coleman, and Tisha Middleton, successfully managed businesses in a rural free civil war community. Their success was due primarily to their initiative and hard work, but they also benefited from an environment that allowed them to flourish. Their customers were willing to patronize them and were satisfied with the service they received from them. Their stories are our stories. Mm, wow, this is so powerful. I I really love these these women and their story because it I feel like it disrupts the narrative um, that that makes you know the black female experience pre Civil War kind of monolithic and it allows them to be to have their sort of unique experiences and you know in the beginning you talked about how there were about 10,000 enslaved people um and you know at any given time you were talking about maybe 100 free black women um and and so i think you know it is definitely a minority but it's important to look at those minorities because they would have I don't know, definitely stood out in this, in this time period. And, um, I, I am so grateful to learn about this from you, especially in a rural area, pre-Civil War. So fascinating. Yeah. And I was taken by the acceptance. You know, uh, part of the reason is that in a, in a frontier area, we, like the story of Idaho was the first when I went to go, um, in a frontier area where it's all hands on board, there's less of the stratification. The studies of Brazil said that when um, people first moved there, the men and the women were side by side, but the more wealthier the family became, the more the woman became a side piece and accessories, mm-hmm. uh, not involved in the marriage or the household. So here we have a frontier area where everybody is welcome. Mm-hmm. Even um, black men found success and they well received. There was a color line, but there was also a, probably more significantly a, um, a, a financial line. That is, the plantation owners visited each other. And people who were not plantation owners did not visit the parties uh, with the plantation owners. So they were mm. not selected to be welcome in that environment. So the people of color who were not plantation owners did not participate in that plantation society 
I would think. Um, but in other places of Louisiana where they uh, where they wealth, where they were wealthy to people of color, they were able to have their own society. But again, they were not really integrated to the plantation society. But on the street level, people were people. Um, I remember reading a story where a woman said in the 1840s, the local grocery store kept two different records, a record of white purchases. Everybody was purchasing on time, and then every so often we'd come in and pay with that bill. Um, but they had two different sets of records, and a white book and had a black book. That's absolute complete preparation for no reason, right? But in West Louisiana Parish, the um, blacksmith had everybody right underneath each other. The store merchants had everybody right underneath each other. Mm -hmm. Separate books for blacks and whites. I kind of get the impression that, and I say in my dissertation, that this um, color line worked to the advantage of wealthy people by keeping non-wealthy people separate. It um, helped them to retain a position of power rather than having and, and sort of the Bacon's Rebellion. You know, if we can keep the poor black and white separated, then we don't have to worry about them. Rebelling. <laughs> democracy and actually voting us out of office. Yeah. You know, without even you know, having everybody hate anybody, just pick a person, hate them, um, rather than uniting to work for the betterment of everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's really fascinating. Is your um, is your dissertation going to be available in book form anytime in the near future? Okay. <laughs> well, when it is, we would love to make it available to everyone through our through our platform because this is, I think, really important history that that um, people need to hear, and I think help tell a more complicated story uh, to, to our students um, about, about the experience pre-Civil War. And uh, I was surprised with what I learned, and I imagine other people would be also, because that, that narrative comes that all Blacks were slaves, which is not true, and that um, those who were not were unhappy, you know, people are unhappy for people, and that's simply not true. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's I my mind's blown. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing this with us. I can't wait to share it with our audience. Um, is there anything that I didn't ask you about that you want to make sure we include? Um, there's not, but it has now slipped my mind. Uh, it is my yeah. There were other women in the parish, but as I said, uh, many of them were seamstresses or washerwomen. Um, they, theoretically, those were their own businesses, but um, they didn't accumulate the amount of finances that these uh, restaurant owners did. You know, they, they went, they went well. And I think it's quite an accomplishment to step out of slavery and run your own successful business. 20 or 30 years. It says something about the talent that went underutilized because of things. Thanks so much for listening to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to bring more voices to the conversation. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.